Thank you. Like you said, you, you didn't have much choice but to be here. Um, <laughs> there is no other track. Uh, my name is Sam, and this talk is, um, is AI and cybersecurity and how to be a 10x engineer. Um, before I get started here, um, this, is, this talk's not sponsored. I'm going to be mentioning some company names, some vendors. Um, really, just, just don't sue me. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not saying their names. I'm, these are all my personal opinions. They don't reflect my employer, all those things. Don't sue me. Um, here's, the, um, here's the agenda. So we're going to kind of have an intro. We're going to talk about AI and how AI is, is moving incredibly fast. Um, we're going to go over sort of an elementary LLM, what, what is a large language model. Um, we're going to go over an open source tool called LangChain. We're going to sort of go over how that works, um, kind of my thoughts on LangChain and how they sort of changed over time. And then at the very end, and this, this totally wasn't planned, but um, we're, <laughs> we're going to kind of build on the whole SOC thing, and we're going we're gonna to do some automation using, um, and, um, using LangChain. So. Um, who I am? I'm, uh, I'm Sam Wallace. Um, you know, I, I have certs. They're all expired. I don't pay the annual thing. Uh, <laughs> I've been in the field about 12 years now. Um, I'm a proud veteran. And, um, yeah, I, I, really, I really just enjoy software. I'm sort of a, a CVE dabbler. Um, but, yeah, I really, really enjoy software. And, um, yeah, I, I've got, I have a website I kind of post on here and there, but, not, you know, nothing too crazy. Um, so, yeah, why, why, you know, why, why should I think about AI? And I, I would kind of put this all in sort of this, the camp of, like, security automation is, like, um, like what, what, what can I get and what's the advantage of this? Um, really, if, if, you're, if you're paying attention, there's a lot of, uh, there's, like, a high demand for security professionals. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen lots of companies out there. They're like, hey, you know, we're, where are all these people at? We're 30% short. Where are all these cybersecurity professionals? And they really just don't exist. Uh, there's, there's, there is that like sort of demand there, and you know that hey, that's good for us. It keeps our salaries high and all that. Um, but um, so that that kind of goes into like why. So again, why why AI? Well, the the thought is is there's a there's a huge opportunity right now um, for people um, to address that cybersecurity shortage. So the businesses have risk, and if they're thirty percent down, the thirty percent's got to come from somewhere, right? So that's where the automation comes in. And that's why using and leveraging AI and LLMs um, can really satisfy that gap. And then um, to, to address this, I, I get this question a lot about when people say, hey, I, you know, where do, I, where do I get started with like AI and LLMs and like what's the chat GPT thing? What are these models and all this? I mean, it's really a, a lot to think about. And I, I think if I had to wipe my brain and start over, I think I would, I would not think about like cybersecurity at all. I would just think, I would just be a really good software developer. I would learn the basics of, I would really learn Python. It's a strong data science language. Um, I would I'd get a strong like software foundation. And then, and then I would maybe start learning cybersecurity. And I think that's, 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 that's definitely the direction um, that, 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 I would, that I would go. Um, so keeping up with um, AI is it's, it's definitely a, a challenge. I would, you know, we're, we're in the cybersecurity space, so we're used to that change, right? We're used to that kind of fast-paced, it's keeping up, it's hard, and there's a lot of sort of maintenance there. And I would, I would argue AI, to an extent, is, is moving even faster than cybersecurity. Um, so, you know, my thoughts have changed over time in all of this, and the code I wrote six months ago just doesn't work um, because they've refactored the library so many times. The documentation I was looking at six months ago, no longer relevant, so everything, it just changed so much. Um, and some other things that have, that have sort of um, went on since I've submitted for this talk is, oh, you know, they, they released the top 10, generally targeting, like, applications. Well, they, they released one um, for a large language model to sort of address that. And I'll have a slide on that, but really, <laughs> that could be its own talk. Um, I just want to mention, hey, I didn't even know about that when I submitted for this talk. And then, you know, lots of large companies like Adobe and AWS and Azure and uh, Google, they're, you know, they're pumping tons of engineering hours in this. They're putting a lot of money into this. Um, so it's, it's all very real, and it's, it's, it's really not going away. Um, and again, so here, here's, here's just the top 10. I'm, I'm really not going to cover this. I just want you to know it exists. There's security time and professionals going into this and looking at, like, okay, like, hey, we're building these large-language models apps. 
And like, what are our new attack, like what are the new attacks that are very specific outside of like traditional like cross-site scripting and SQL injection? Like what else do I have to worry about when I build these apps? And this is like their version, I think they're on version like 1.2 now, so, um, but it's, it's finally ver you know, past version one. So this is kind of what, where we're landed on the, on the top 10. And then, you know, <laughs> more exciting things in the AI, you know, it's moving fast. Um, it can now um, see, it can now hear, and it can now speak, which I, I know what you're thinking, and I'm thinking the same exact thing. Um, you know, <laughs> this is how you get Skynet, right? This is definitely, we're, we're almost there. We're about to arrive at Skynet. Um, so I thought that was a fun little thing um, that they're, they're working on. Um, and then, yeah, so it's, it's moving fast and, you know, they're really like, do you, people feel like, hey, am I, am I behind? Is it too late for me to kind of like start learning about LMMs and start building apps? Um, is, it, is it, you know, and I would say, I would say no. I would say you're exactly where you need to be. I think going to talks like this and then learning is, um, is exactly where you need to be. So don't feel overwhelmed. Everyone's overwhelmed trying to keep up with just cybersecurity alongside AI. So, you, you know, you're not feeling anything abnormal here. And I would, I would argue, um, you know, joining sort of later, you'd like the late adopter may have an advantage over like an early adopter like myself because you don't have all this legacy knowledge and all this code to rewrite and all these like pre-existing mindset. You kind of come in fresh. Um, so I would argue not behind it all. It's a great time to jump in, great time to start learning about this stuff. Yeah, and this, uh, this bear agrees with you. Um, so a brief, like this is like a 101, we're, we're, this is really not the focus of the talk about explaining exactly uh, what an LMM is, but um, basically think of it as, as there's, there's input and then there's output. You know, you, you ask questions and you get back answers, right? That's kind of like fundamentally what's going on. Um, there's, you know, thousands and thousands of engineering hours and money. There's companies with large data pipelines where they process documents. Um, there's, there's really a lot going on with that. You'll hear the word parameters here and there. Generally, more parameters is, it's better, um, but it's sort of like a diminishing return. So if I say like 14 billion parameter model, you know, generally that would be better than a 7 billion, but it's not twice as good. It's maybe, you know, so there's <laughs> some of those verbiages, uh, but really there's like text generation, there's text translation, there's summarization, and then there's like your, your general Q&A um, use cases. And then, um, I, you know, a lot, of, a lot of companies out there, they're all trying to like roll their own, like, hey, we're gonna build our own large language model. We're definitely gonna do this. And really, the, the problem with this thinking is, first, it's, it's very expensive to do that. It's not cheap at all to do that. And then, really, the, the, the problem is on line 10 here, is I'm, I'm using the OpenAI library, and I'm, I'm asking a question in under 10 lines of code, and I'm getting back answers. And it's, it's I mean, it's, it's gonna be incredibly hard to, to be, um, to have a better model than what they're producing with the 3.5 turbo, with the new DaVinci ones. I mean, they're, they're really, I'm not saying <laughs> you, you couldn't beat it, but it'd be so expensive to do it. Um, and it's incredibly easy to use their models. Um, and I've had, a, I've had a lot of success doing that. Um, and then you also have all the same risk that they face as well with hallucination, incorrect data, um, and you have to solve all the challenges yourself. And then, um, you know, you, you also have, with LMMs, you have like limitations with like, hey, you know, they're, they're really not gonna know about like real-time context. So in like security world, you know, IP, IP data, IP, IP intel, like it lasts like a day, right? It lasts even less than that. It, it goes quick. Uh, maybe you've got an alert. That context, it needs to be like from right now. And, um, you, you know, so these, these LLM limitations um, definitely need to be addressed to even consider them using any sort of security capacity, uh, given how, how things and how quickly they change. Um, so I wanted to cover, um, in the LM world, the solution that sort of gets around this is called um, using a vector database. It's essentially, on the left side, you'll see a, a document, and then you'll see it converting into embeddings. It just converts it into numbers. Really, it's, 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 it's nothing more than your prompt includes that net context whenever you answer that question. Um, there's a lot of different, so I, I've got Chroma up there, um, but there's a lot of different um, 
vector databases out there. Postgres now, they have their own extension, PG Vector, that lets you do it. Um, and there's like SaaS tools like Pinecone, which are pretty popular. Um, but I would say Chroma, Chroma is definitely like pretty good for like quick, uh, quick uh, proof of concepts. And then, um, yeah, so let's get into LangChain. So LangChain's a, um, it's, you know, it's an open source library that is intended to build uh, LLM apps very quickly. And um, the, LangChain's not a large language model. Um, it's not a, like, it's, it's, a, it's a tool to like build AI apps. It's not itself. So think of it as like the, think of it as like the shovel. So here, um, LangChain is, they're not selling you an LLM. I mean, it's open source anyways, but they're more so selling you the, the shovel, right? So you can build your own tool. And like I said, it's, it's open source. You can find it on GitHub. You know, it's got a ton of activity. You know, you see in the top right all the stars. It's got a ton of commits. And then like when I submitted for this talk, it was probably maybe like 1,800 commits or so. And now we're well over, you know, 4,000. And um, yeah, there's an incredible amount of um, activity with LinkChain. So um, yeah, definitely recommend. It's like just on GitHub, totally free to use. But when you think about LinkChain, you, you really should think about it being like an orchestrator in the middle. So you've got your problem that you need to solve, and LangChain is sort of that glue in the middle that connects all, your, all, all the different nodes. So in the top there, we've got our vector store, which is kind of what we talked about before. We, we take the documents, convert them into embeddings. We need to store them somewhere. It's just, it's just a database. Um, and then on the left side, you've got your large language model. So think like your, your 3.5 turbo or whatever model you're using. LangChain would be that sort of middleman to, hey, let's query the database, get that context just in time, and then let's um, add that to our prompt, which then goes to our LMM. Um, so it's, it's sort of that glue in the middle that, that connects all these concepts. And that's really why it has a lot of good, um, really has a lot of popularity in the community, just because um, they, they make it easy. They build a lot of those integrations for you, and um, it's... And, it, and it's all in Python, too, which makes it even easier to use. Um, so here, I, I wanted to demonstrate, like, what, what, what's really going on here and, like, all the layers of abstraction. So here's you. You know, you're happy you're, you're using LangChain, but really LangChain is just using the OpenAI library, right? They build that code for you. And that's really just using the Python request library, which is really just accessing the ChatGPT API, which is really like backed by Python, which Python is just an abstraction on top of C. And you kind of see what's going on here is like, whenever I'm using LangChain, there's like, there's like a mountain of work that's already happened in layers and layers of abstraction. Um, and you'll see, um, <laughs> you'll see a tweet by Lex here. Um, and it, it, kind of, it kind of makes you think about it all a little bit differently and kind of all the work that, go it kind of makes you appreciate the work. Um, and it kind of confirms my mind that you know, it really is turtles all the way down for sure. <laughs> um, and then, like, like I said, my, my thoughts on LangChain, like, since I've started using, have, have kind of changed over time. And I, I would say it's, it's like, um, it's an excellent library to try out and use and sort of get familiar with all the different, like, concepts of building an app using LMMs. Um, but it, it feels a little, like, leaky in places. And what I mean by that is, like, like say you're, say you're playing a video game, say you're playing the new you know, Baldur's Gate 3, and you're, you're having a really good time, and then all of a sudden you get like a little visual pop-up and it says, hey, you know, you're, you're at, your graphics card's out of memory. And that, that feels really bad, and now I'm, like, now, I'm not, now I'm aware I'm not playing a game, I'm actually on a computer, and like, there's like errors, and that's how, that's how LangChain feels at times. Um, so, <laughs> so I, I, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of controversy here, like, hey, is LangChain worth using? Is it not worth using? I say definitely, definitely check it out. Um, as for, like, a production use case, I, I'm still kind of on the fence on it, um, but I think, you know, I think, I mean, you can see all the activity. It's, it's going to get there. Um, so, yeah, so here's, here's sort of the, the core of the idea here. It's like, hey, could, could, we use, could we use a large language model to effectively address one of our problems. So in this specific problem here, um, we want to build a system that can look at like SOC alerts. So most of us in our career have, at one point have been a SOC analyst or we've, we've looked at alerts, we've got EDR tools, that's all great, right? Um, the expensive part about all that is actually reviewing those alerts 
and then closing them out. Um, so really, let's, let's build a system that's fast. Let's build a system that requires no humans. And let's build a system that has that alert context just in time. And then let's also make decisions based on that, um, that data. Um, so like this is a very, very simplified SOC version. Like an alert comes in. So we've got the top left, we've got, let's say an EDR alert comes in. Um, hey, it's late at night. Maybe it takes a half hour for someone to jump on to take a look at it. And it takes them, you know, they're, they're, they're waking up and it takes them another half hour to sort of say, hey, this is, a, this is a true positive and we should really like kick off our incident response playbook and go through that process. But here's my, here's my thinking on this is, you know, what if we could build a system that, hey, it automatically looks at that alarm. It does that analysis for me and I have confidence in that system enough for it to automatically close that alarm. Um, so <laughs> it, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a different concept there where it's um, a little bit different than security automation because we're actually using the LM to derive um, results from that um, alarm data. Um, so let's, so we're gonna kind of go step by step here and how, how you might wanna build this app out. So on the left side, think of this as whatever EDR tool you have, whatever alert, maybe you know, you've got, it doesn't matter, it's an endpoint or whatever. Let's just call this, this is an alert that happens and we would expect an analyst to respond to this in a certain amount of time. Um, but in this instance, we're gonna have our, our AI system in front of that to sort of handle these alerts and we're gonna use LangChain to proxy that. So like I said, with the, um, the vector database, which is where we're taking the documents, so think of the documents as like your incident response playbooks, think of it as your tool, user documentation, your IT standards, and then like any sort of wiki pages. We take those documents, we convert them into embeddings, and then we allow um, our system to be aware of that. Um, so in the same way that an analyst would be aware of those documents, this system would be as well. But you know, we, we wanna build a system that works all the time and it works through changes. So we wanna make sure that our documents update as well. So whenever someone updates a doc or maybe the tool has a new version with new features in the tooling, we wanna make sure our system is aware of that. So we're gonna build in a, um, you know, we're gonna build a system here to sort of refresh our documents and if it is a new document, it's gonna refresh those embeddings as well. Um, so here on the right side, uh, like I said, LangChain has like an ecosystem of support. So like a lot of the tools you use, like think of like your virus totals, your gray noises, your Yuba solutions. Um, LangChain has a, probably has an adapter for that or an easy way to interact with those systems. So say your, your alert comes in and it has an IP address. Well, wouldn't it be great if my system could automatically make that request come back and then use that, um, and use that response as context to make a decision? Um, so here we can do that. Um, we can connect, a, you know, our Yuba, our gray noise, and we have all that additional context that we provide in the prompt to make decisions. And then, of course, you know, hey, our identity people get really excited about this. Hey, you know, it'd be really awesome if the alert's about a user. We should pull in, like, all the Active Directory stuff. We should pull in all the metadata. Hey, is this a VIP user? We should add that as context as, as well. Maybe that'll improve the accuracy of our results on this system. I won't, I won't go too deep into this, but LangChain has a concept um, called agents. Uh, basically, it's, think of it as a way, it's like a series of prompts where it's asking, would it be helpful if I looked into the vector database? Would it be helpful if, if I queried virus total? And depending on that, it would make further decisions. Um, <laughs> it's it's kind of magical to an extent, um, but it's, it's, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of leave that to where it is. Um, and then so once we get all this context, so we have our alerts, maybe it used some documents from the vector database, maybe it made a few API requests, and then actually it puts that into the prompt, and then we actually uh, query the large language model and say, hey, you know, what, what, what should we do with this? Um, you know, and this is, this is going to be more enterprise-y, right? So we want to make sure we're sending logs off. Uh, we want to make sure, hey, if, if this thing actually closes an alarm, we should probably have like a Slack alert, so we're gonna do a Slack alert. And on the left side, this is kind of to demonstrate like, we're gonna, be, we're gonna do continue analysis to see if this system is effective and is it, is it uh, operating the way that we expect. And I, um, to prepare for this talk, I, I wrote some code, so you can steal all my code if you want. Um, basically here, what I'm 
really want to focus in on is on line 119. You see a really ugly PowerShell command. Um, really hard to read, right? Like, I mean, if you're in, if you've done like OSCP or any sort of like pen testing, you kind of know what's going on here. But if you're like a junior analyst, you, this is this is really hard to read and really hard to like kind of wrap your head around. Um, however, large language models are really excellent at breaking this down and, and making it easy to understand. So here you can see uh, we're actually building our prompt using our context. So we're saying, hey, you're an AI program who only speaks in JSON. And the, uh, the JSON part there is, is a bit magical. So <laughs> when we say you only speak in JSON, it means we're going to only get back JSON. And JSON objects um, easily parsable using Python, and you have access to the key value pairs. On the bottom here, we're um, giving an example response of what our expected output would be. So we're asking the model, hey, do, would you consider this malicious? Uh, we're going to ask it, what's your confidence that you're correct? And then on line 81, we're actually going to ask the model, should we, should we close this alarm? Is, is, this, is this a false positive? And would you recommend closing the alarm? And then um, here, here's me just running it locally. Um, no, no, no pretty UI here, just running it right in my prompt. Um, the, the main point out here is the explanation um, is correct. It was able to identify it was a reverse shell, um, which depending on the, the analyst's level, they may have not been able to do that. Um, the confidence score is 90, so it's very confident. Um, and the close alarm Boolean here is set to false. So this one, this one would not actually close the alarm. So this is, this is exactly what we want for the model, and it's doing, um, it's doing a lot of the analyst work for me, and I don't necessarily have to do that myself if I trust the system. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so really, the question here is, like, should I, should I trust AI? Is this something that I could even do? Will this work at my company? Um, my, my thought is, like, you know, any, any good security professional is going to say, I literally trust nothing. And I think that's where you should be as well. Um, what I would say is, why, why, not, why not get metrics on how effective this would be? And why not get metrics on how effective your current solution is? And then, and then compare that. And is this, is this better? Um, and if it is, then I would, I would argue, definitely worth exploring and pushing that development work. Um, it can certainly be a force multiplier at your business. And I, I have found that to be, um, I found to be really effective in some scenarios and not so in others, but it really depends on the, the use case you're pushing. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, kind of my, my closing thoughts on like AI and LMMs and all that. Um, yeah, cybersecurity and AI, it's, it's all moving very fast. And I, I would say you're, you're, not, you're not behind, you, you know, you're exactly where you need to be. If, if you're trying to get into the cybersecurity space or learn about AI, it's, it's really not about like how, how fast you're running, it's more about the direction you're going. Um, so <laughs> please, please don't feel overwhelmed. I know there's, there's really a, a lot going on in this space and I, I find myself struggling to keep up at times as well. Um, so totally normal, but you know, you know, this little dog says, you got this. So I feel better about that. <laughs> um, here is some links. So I've linked the, uh, the OWASP top 10, and I've got a little website I write stuff on occasionally. And then also the, um, the code is uh, available on GitHub.